Would you please pray with me? Eternal God, on this day of palms and passion, we pray that your Holy Spirit will open our minds and hearts to hear your holy word and your calling to us. Silence in us any voice but your voice, that hearing we may also obey your will. Guide us through this holy week, experiencing the joy and the pain as we await the day of resurrection. Amen. The church liturgical calendar designates today, the sixth Sunday in Lent, as Palm and Passion Sunday. Today marks the beginning of Holy Week, a week of tremendous emotions. And in the short span of eight days, we will proceed from the crowds in Jerusalem hailing Jesus as the Messiah, to his last meal with the disciples, to his betrayal and trial, and on to the horror of the crucifixion. But then it's on to the exquisite joy of the resurrection. So most people refer to today as Palm Sunday, but we also need to focus on the passion of Christ, Passion Sunday. Now our English vocabulary defines passion as an intense or violent emotion. And I, most people, I think, um, consider the word passion it's kind of about um, love relationships or um, passionate about work or some activity. But that meaning did not come into common usage until the 16th century. The original inference of the word passion comes from the Latin pati, that is the root of the English word patient. And in the Latin, passion means to suffer, like a patient suffers. When we refer to the passion of Jesus, we mean his suffering and his death. So the scripture readings this morning, there are two different ones. There is one listed in your uh, bulletin, and there'll be a second one, and I'll announce it when we get there. So there are two parts, in a sense, to the scriptures this morning. The liturgy of the palms for Palm Sunday, and the liturgy of the passion of Jesus, Passion Sunday. So we begin with a Palm Sunday reading from the Gospel of Mark, that reveals the fulfillment of a prophecy from the prophet Zechariah in chapter 9, written about 500 years before the birth of Christ. And this, the passage in Zechariah prophesied the coming of Israel's king, fulfilled through Jesus. So I'm going to read from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11, you can follow along on the screen or in your Bible as you wish. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. And as they untied it, some people there asked, what are you doing untying the colt? They answered as Jesus told them, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, Jesus sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany 
with the twelve. Here ends the first reading. Now spreading cloaks and palm branches on the ground was a custom of welcoming a king in that time. So by spreading those branches, the Jews were honoring Jesus, whom they believed was the long-awaited Messiah, their Savior, as promised in the Hebrew Scriptures. They had been waiting hundreds of years for this moment and the fulfillment of the Hebrew Scriptures. So we can sense the exaltation as Jesus rode into Jerusalem with the crowd hailing him as the ancestor of their beloved King David. And we shared in the joyful celebration this morning through the children and the procession with the music. It's a small way for us to remember what that Palm Sunday must have been like for those who believed in Jesus. But how quickly the scene changes. Only a few days after the shouts of Hosanna, the high priests are conspiring against Jesus, and Judas, as we know, agrees to betray Jesus. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the city was preparing for the annual Passover feast, and the population of Jerusalem probably tripled during that time. So Jews were traveling from long distances for this Jewish holy day. So there would have been many pilgrims on the road and many involved in this celebration and laying the palms and calling out Hosanna. But some folks would like to jump from those Hosannas of Palm Sunday and jump right over to Easter Sunday and skip the week in between without considering the pain and the suffering and the sacrifice of Jesus. But the suffering is integral to the story of Jesus and to our faith. And thus this morning, I have also added a scripture reading about Christ's suffering. Now, the Gospels include many chapters about what occurred during the, the days that we now call Holy Week. But we will look at a passage from Mark describing part of what happened after Jesus had eaten his last meal with the disciples and they departed to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus knew what lay ahead for him. We have to always remember that Jesus was divine, but was also human. And he had to know about human suffering and death. And in the garden, he prayed fervently to God, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus knew where he was heading. Fearful, perhaps. Did he understand the true suffering that he would go through as he was also human? So next I want to share a scripture which we call a Passion Sunday reading. It's Mark chapter 15, verses 1 to 4. Hear this gospel message for you. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. And the chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of? But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now, it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. 
And the crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews, asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why, what crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe, put on his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. Here ends the second reading. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And here, my friends, we sit with the weight of all of this, from the hosannas to the crucifixion, from the great exaltation to the great grief beyond our comprehension, from the palms to the passion. And how painful to hear those words. It breaks my heart when I hear it now. Crucify him. In the week ahead, Holy Week, our focus will be on the passion or the suffering of Jesus. But one asks, where is the joy or the hope? Where is the good news? Because the word gospel means good news, but where is the good news in these gospel passages of betrayal and shouts of crucify him? But we are fortunate, are we not? Because we already know the end of the story. We know what's going to happen on Easter Sunday. And that can help us get through this week. But can you imagine the pain and the grief experienced by the disciples and the many other men and women who had been following Jesus and believed that he was the promised Messiah? When I read this passage, something jumped out at me. And I began to wonder about Simon the man who the soldiers forced to carry the cross for Jesus, presumably because Jesus must have been so weak and battered from the beating the soldiers had inflicted on him. So I wonder, how did Simon have to be, happen to be standing with the crowd that day? Because the text tells us that Simon was a Jew from Cyrene, which is a city in North Africa, that had a large Jewish population. Simon probably had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast, the annual religious festival that celebrates that God, through Moses, freed the Jewish people from the slavery in Egypt, across the Red Sea, and eventually into the Promised Land. But biblical scholarship points out something interesting 
that Simon must have been not just a stranger in the crowd, but someone that was known to the disciples, at least to the gospel writers, because he is named specifically. We find many unnamed people in the Bible, but they name him not only Simon, but they give the names of his children, perhaps as a verification of which Simon he was. Simon was somewhat of a common name. So did Simon get caught up in the jeering and taunting crowd that were there to see these crucifixions? Or had something else drawn him there? I can't help but wonder if he had met Jesus or heard Jesus preach or seen Jesus do a healing. So why was it the soldiers grabbed Simon? He had to have been at the front of the crowd, don't you think? if they were able to just pull him in to take the cross. I wonder if Simon was staring at Jesus or staring at the soldiers or perhaps even tried to speak to Jesus. But we can only imagine this experience of carrying this heavy wooden cross for Jesus. This must have changed his life once he later learned that this Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Sometimes the Bible brings me these kinds of thoughts and ponderings, wondering about these people who had the privilege to know Jesus in some way or another. But this cross of the crucifixion reminds me of Jesus' words to his disciples in Matthew 16, 24. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The focus of this coming Holy Week is the cross and the suffering that Jesus bore for all of us upon that cross. For all its violence and brutality, think about it, the cross has become a symbol of hope for all God's people. The cross represents the intersection of heaven and earth. Think of it this way that the straight support points up to heaven. And the crossbar represents the world, our world, the earth. And Jesus on the cross joins heaven and earth together for all eternity. In gratitude for God's gift of grace and forgiveness, and the promise of eternal life. May we be willing to take up our crosses in faithful service to sue our Savior, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, remembering that Jesus suffered for each one of us. And today, nearly 2,000 years later, Jesus suffers with us with each one of us. No burden can be too heavy in any of our lives when you know that Jesus is walking with you, suffering with you, and I believe carrying the other end of your cross. Amen.